All right, part E. This is uh, Big Data Applications and Analytics, the overview section. And in part E, we're going to describe the big data aspects for science, which is, you know, in universities, uh, it's good typically to look at areas you have particular value in, and for obvious reasons, as scientific research is dominated by universities, to look at issues which uh, have applicability across industry and science, but to look at them from the science point of view gives you insights which are novel and important. Um, plus, we can probably get science data a little easier than a lot of commercial data. So here we are. So we start off with a very old slide describing a very old idea. Well, pretty old, maybe um, 20 years old, um, called cyber infrastructure, which is the which is the electronic infrastructure plus the, the associated needed hardware that supports distributed research and learning, and it has associated with it e-science, e-research, and e-education. And it links data, people, and computers together. It started at the, I say, 20 years ago when Web 2.0 was just coming online. Then uh, soon it effectively had to incorporate clouds. They weren't in this original concept. Uh, the, there was also a concept that was there near the beginning called grids, which have actually gone down the trough of disillusionment because they proved to be too difficult to implement. And um, but it. The concepts that were in grids actually live on, because uh, you do need to manage what all this infrastructure. You have to look at the security, and you have to host supercomputers. The reason why grids ran into trouble was they were trying to manage large distributed computer systems, and they found trouble due to different rules in different domains. And so somehow, even though it was logically simple to do, it turned out to effectively impractical because you couldn't get different supercomputers and different domains to have enough some, enough agreement on some sort of core core things to make things work easily. Now, this cyber infrastructure is intrinsically parallel. Everything in the, I mean, the world is parallel. The reason that 50 million uh, computers in the cloud is they're operating in parallel, and that's partly because there are seven billion people, and those seven billion people, or some fraction of them, up to 50%, are actually accessing the clouds, doing separate things. One also gets parallelism when a, in, in a, a talented individual invokes lots of computers in the in the cloud or on the supercomputer to do a single job, and. Um, that that's, uh, was the actual origin of the parallel computing of trying to get individual jobs to run real fast by chopping the job up. Uh, in the case of um, many of the cloud applications, that chopping up is automatically done because it's chopped up by people or uh, sessions, which are naturally done separately. But and the reason why you need so many computers is not because they're all talking to each other, solving a single problem. They're all they're each solving separate problems or multiple separate problems. And uh, when we look at this cyber infrastructure, it's a mix of it's it's either clusters which are relatively close together, or it could be distributed. You could have a system in Timbuktu linked to a system in Indianapolis, and. Distributed computing is closely related to parallel computing, except that the Issues and usage of distributed systems is modified because there is highest latency milliseconds between nodes, whereas the latency on a parallel computer is fractions of a microsecond. And uh, here we point out this issue as to why we need parallelism. We want to get individual jobs to run fast, and we also need to get uh, uh, lots of jobs to run fast. And I say distributed tends to be associated with the lots of job case because the latency doesn't matter. If you have 5,000 jobs running and they don't talk to each other, they can run on Timbuktu and Indianapolis separately, and it doesn't really matter so much. And this again, these by the way, this whole slide is really old, and this so this shows what we were thinking about um, 
whatever it was, 10 years ago. And uh, so we actually did have Zooming, high definition video conferencing. We had digital libraries, we had e-learning curriculum, we had uh, accessing scientific papers, um, like archives, simulating new battery design, that is still a classic exascale problem. Sharing data from the world's telescopes, we'll come to that. Person genomics, that's also, we mentioned, we can mention that. Uh, analyzing tweets, looking, uh, looking, uh, and those tweets will have um, insights in it which will maybe be negative about certain stocks, and people have used that to predict how well stocks will do on the in the stock market. Uh, well, we well-known application of tweeting was to look at uh, see how disease indications were were being tweeted about, trying to work out how many people got flu. Google did that first, and then for some reason ran into disgrace. Even though I think they did a pretty good job, they just somehow over overhyped it. Anyway, lots of things, and um, this cyber infrastructure is meant to provide a more equal world because we're all um, we can all access all this data. Now right, we can have E in front of anything, so that's why these right at the beginning I often talked about E more or less anything. I think E more or less anything is completely. Um, uh, um, clear from today's uh, world that uh, everything can go online, and you know people just keep marching on, putting a new thing online and adding the word E in front of it. Well, around 20 years ago, science was had E added to it. There was this um, fellow called John Taylor who was in the United Kingdom who uh, first associated that word, and if you like. E with these cyber infrastructure, e-science, they're all closely related concept. And um, again, e-science is about the cyber infrastructure which will support science. Just as e-business or e-learning um, e are about how this, we build this, the technology to support electronic business and electronic learning. And of course, with uh, social media, we have e-having fun and with um, Large-scale uh, repositories like Archive, we have e-digital library, and we of course have lots of um, paintings and everything online for e-fine arts. And all of this is, as we remember those two pretty pictures where everything was either diverging or converging from the center, that was the deluge of data. And this, uh, this uh, thing intrinsically means people, computers, data, which comes from sensors and instruments, they're linked by hardware and software network. Our first discussion of science and cyber infrastructure is physics and the accelerator at uh, CERN, the Large Hadron Collider. Here's the booster acceler which accelerator, which gets the protons and ions up to their initial uh, energy. And then they all roar around this 17 mile circumference outer ring. And every now and then there's a collision here for the different experiments. There are four major experiments, ATLAS here, ALICE here, CMS here, and LHCB here. Uh, ATLAS and CMS are the largest. Here is a picture of the ATLAS experiment just showing how, although these particles are sizes of Fermi's, tiny things, <laughs> they actually require a pretty big apparatus to study them. And here's the apparatus. And here are the people. So some of the people just use that to size the apparatus. Notice the apparatus is full of detectors and magnets and things, because when these, say, typically two protons will collide, when they collide, they produce a huge spray of other particles, which, have, which are of different types, electrons, muons, pions, um, possibly protons again on neutrons, and they are det detected in um, a variety of different devices and their tracks are bent in magnetic fields so that you can measure their momentum. And I say this is 45 meters by 25 meters and 7,000 tons. So it's a non trivial apparatus. Uh, the data, which is over a megabyte in size per event, is um, 
comes out in raw fashion, actually it's triggered, they, they, hard, they record a tiny fraction of the total data because they know what they're looking for. Um, and so when you look at big data, you have to realize this data is filtered already. You only see the data that's viewed slightly interesting. So you then run it through a reconstruction program, which might take 10 minutes. Then you produce a smaller size piece of data, which has meant to have everything in it necessary for analysis. This is um, analysis object data. Uh, tags, a very tiny file per, for each event, which allow you to, to put, uh, this metadata allows you to pick the event you want. And using the AOD and tags, you then do physics. But actually a lot of the work, if not 90% of the work is in this section here. The accelerator itself, uh, taking the building this apparatus, keeping it working, monitoring all its uh, measuring devices. That's data engineering. And each event is totally independent, and this process is independent. However, when you're looking, say, for Higgs, you're looking for accumulation of events. So that's event data aggregation. And that's done at the last stage on this AOD data. And those, and those, you also don't look at all AOD, you just look at the data selected by tags. This is a, a visualization of a typical event. Actually, this is meant to be a Higgs boson. And you can see the type of thing you would trigger on. This is a huge amount of particles going off to the side. That's incredibly unusual. One in, I don't know, a billion times or a million times, depending how far it goes out and with what energy. And you trigger on such, uh, such signals, because in nearly all events, the protons just come each year and they do almost nothing. And everything goes forward, follows the two protons. The protons are coming in along here and along here colliding. And I say most of what happens is just in the direction they came. And here it says 50, I now say 100 petabytes of data per year. That's actually a mixture of real data and simulations, because you need to run lots of Monte Carlo simulations of the apparatus to estimate the probability of detecting certain events. Because although these apparatus are enormous, they're not perfect, and they only actually uh, can see some, some, some events and some parts of events. And then there's a giant computing facility which has hundreds of thousands of cores around the world. And they, they're called TIERS, Tier Zero is the accelerator or CERN, the host of the accelerator itself. Tier one is nations, uh, and there are actually tier ones for ATLAS, tier ones for CMS and so on. And tier two are regional, the uh, Indiana University has a regional tier two for ATLAS. And um, this again is old, but in one time, CMS was seven tier one and 50 tier two. I'm sure that's bigger, especially the tier two. And I'm sure CERN Data Center has far more than 200 petabytes of data. Um, and there's an article I wrote with the friends, uh, Andrew Thetton and Tony Hay, which is, um, which is linked here, which has where, where does all the data come from. It's again, it's now old. But at least at the time it was written, about four years ago, it was a reasonably accurate description. And it goes into a little more detail about this physics process. Here we have uh, the actual discovery of the Higgs from the ATLAS experiment. The CMS is similar. Actually, notice that there are two experiments which are, have the same general philosophy and the same general goals. And they have two for a simple reason. You don't really believe the results from one experiment. These are so complex, and so many things can go wrong. You like to do it twice. And <clears throat> you look at these um, final particles here. We're looking at the Higgs boson going to two photons. And uh, you look at, you can reconstruct the mass because you can measure the energy and direction of those photons. And you can see there is a nice little bump here, which is the Higgs boson. And that's after we've subtracted the background. And here you have a background. So here's this is a model. And this is a very classic model. And this, this model here would not be a deep learning model. It's called mathematical model. You build a model of what you think the distribution would look like.
And based on that model, you can determine the mass of the Higgs and estimate the uh, width of the Higgs. The Higgs is, the width here is probably uh, dominantly experimental resolution. But the particle itself has a width it's, it's, uh, because it decays. And the measurement has a width because you're not measuring everything with a perfect resolution. It's because it's just a real mess. These photons are, cra are being probably measured by how, what, how much energy they give off when they, when they interact with some some material. Usually, it's lead for photons, but I don't know quite well know what Atlas is using. But it's, these are very. This is all physics. You 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 know when you want to measure a photon or a muon or an electron or a proton or a pion. You look at the properties of those and design detectors that are sensitive to those properties. Photons aren't bent. Photons, however, do really they present they give chaos when they hit heavy heavy material like lead. Here is a not CERN but um, Brookhaven, and um, which is this Northrop Grumman. This is just showing. Um, a giant accelerator ring, and in this ring you have particles traveling, and you have magnets, which are, in the case of LHC, certainly superconducting magnets. They probably are here, and now you do that because those have the best. They give you the best magnetic field for a given use of power and money. And this field has probably pioneered supercomputing magnets. I, I, I'm not quite certain that there are probably not dramatically large numbers of commercial applications there are. There are some, I think. And here is what it says. This is the RIC, which is uh, actually a still up to date um, accelerator at Brookhaven in uh, Long Island. And by the IC, so it stands for Ion Collider. And so it is not actually accelerating protons, it's accelerating very heavy ions. I don't know what they are, uranium maybe or something. And then they have these giant ions, which are all bags of protons and neutrons smashing into each other. And the mess they get is even worse than CERN. Here is another the other major big science, which is the Astronomy, and um, you, the, Hubble is so wonderful that you get pictures from Hubble uh, from NASA every every day or every week. Typically, every week they have a new galaxy or a, a new uh, nebula that they've uh, they've photographed, or possibly a planet. And then we have accelerators on the Earth, which of course are subject to atmospheric interference. The one I was most familiar with, Panama, because I was at Caltech, and Panama was just south of Caltech, and was somehow a telescope that established modern, modern astronomy, because it made a lot of the early observations. So now, effectively, um, obsolescent. I don't think it's. I think it's still used because you can, there's still a survey experiments you can do with the smaller telescopes. Here is the most famous telescope at the moment, the uh, SKA, the Square Kilometer Array. I think it's spread between Australia and South Africa. And it has got these giant arrays of large and small detectors. And they're all, they're all gathering data simultaneously. And they, by looking at the differences between these multiple detectors, you can actually remove a lot of interference. Very remarkable, very large scale. Initial data analysis. So this is a good example of data engineering. The astronomy looks at the final data, but that final data comes from merging all these uh, probably thousands of instruments, and that that merging removes an enormous amount of noise. And that's why they're building this particular design. It's a well-known idea in radio astronomy. And here is another aspect of uh, big science and astronomy, which is that um, you can take measurements of the sky, a particular region of the of the co cosmos in different um, wavelengths and get different information. Here's radio, far infrared, visible, density, dust, visible, and x-ray. And they all look pretty different. 
Here is one I was involved with, uh, but no, no longer, which was um, Polygrid. We built that in 2008. Um, that, that was when clouds were invented. Well, we were doing we were doing both clouds, and actually Polygrid was before 2008. But it was really going full steam in 2008. It was just started before then. And there was a collaboration with Elizabeth City University uh, and also Kansas University. Kansas was the lead. They have a center called Cresis, Center for Remote Sensing of Ice Sheets. And they're incredible engineers who can build the most marvelous devices. And we were able to help them by um, Building the software and computer infrastructure to analyze this. And um, this data is taken in all sorts of ways on devices like this, from aircraft. They all are just full of um, radars. The radar again has to do initial processing and then writes the data to disk because there's no internet connection to uh, the North Pole, at least not a very good one. You take those disks and ship them back on a plane or FedEx or you, well, here you see Fed to uh, actually get them into a computer center such as at IU or else in, elsewhere in the US. Here is a famous plot from um, NIH, which in this, in this, this is its latest version. It, if you go to this site here, you'll find that it's changes every year or something. Um, and it compares the Moore's Law, which is the uh, um, tracks the performance of computers, or rather here, the cost of a certain amount of computing, and it's going down exponentially. However, here is the cost for producing a human genome, which was first produced up here. And then it slowly decreased. Well, it actually went down a factor of 10. But then it shut down here. And now it's actually at $1,000, which is a million times cheaper than when it started in 2001. So that's in factor of 20, a factor of, sorry, in 20 years, a factor of a million. So that's not too bad. However, it is actually a little alarming. It's sort of leveled off. It's, it's, it's sort of got stuck at $1,000 per genome. And although I think the devices are getting more compact and they're easy, more accessible. This is I just this is in 2020 Illumina's latest device, the NovaSeq 6000, and they've sold a thousand of those, which I think came out. This came out in 2017, which says that this is no longer annual progress. It is slightly stabilized. They they're obviously improving things and extending capabilities, but there hasn't been a revolution since here, 2015. 2014. There was a factor of eight drop there. Um, but the biggest change came from 2007 to 2010. That was when the slope was cheapest. This green is the cost per genome. Okay. All right, so we've just been doing big science with uh, large experimental groups like, uh, you know, LHC has thousands of people and hundreds of institutions on each of their experiments, CMS and ATLAS. But that contrasts with what's called the long tail of science, which is individual scientists doing um, experiments and uh, studies which are not in giant groups. And so this is illustrated by this picture here. We have the size of the data set, which is 100 petabytes for here. And it will be far more than that for SKA. Genomics is sort of a little lower. But there are also more genomes, genome sequences than there are accelerators. So we, here we have number of research groups growing and the size of the data sets going down. And this part here is called the long tail. And uh, we remember the whole world is dominated by the fact that 7 billion people all using their smartphones to do things. That's what's driving clouds and everything at the moment. So we're very familiar with long tails. And um, this is a famous 80-20 rule, which applies to many things that 20% uh, of something is responsible for 80% of something else here, it's users and data. And of course, whether it's 80-20 or 90-10 or 75-25 or 99-1 is uh, 
varies from case to case, but the principle is, is still true. You see that in um, rec in um, books that um, uh, if you look at books, there are a few books which are incredibly popular. That's this uh, red part here, and then there are lots of books which each of which is read a little times. And one feature of um, the online approach to everything is you actually expose the long tail to everybody. Whereas if you have a bookstore, you really have to focus on this uh, part here, because that's where you get enough sales to be economic. Here we have um, a list which I made a little while ago of um, data intensive applications, which are the types of things we're doing. We have particle physics and information retrieval and web search and e-commerce and social networking and health informatics, gathering data from webcams. We're using <coughs> statistics or deep or machine learning. We're doing image analysis. We're running recommender engines. And we're looking for anomalies. And we're doing this on clouds and we're using MapReduce and TensorFlow and PyTorch and things like that. And uh, in science, we tend to use words like space. In information retrieval, we use bags of documents, and but the some concept is pretty similar. Here is a very old, uh, 20, 2008, about the end of science. It was one of the better word uh, articles because it was sort of wrong in some sense, but right, very, very perceptive in another sense. And it describes the fact that uh, in this new world, we're no longer driven by theories to the same extent. We're driven by data. And um, that was one of the early articles identifying the importance of the big data approach. I told you, big data is not so important from its size. It's important from its approach. The data gives you the answer, not the theory. Then we have these four paradigms of scientific research. Theory, these was actually 40 years ago, these were the only two methods, theory and experiment. And then we came to computational science, which is simulation on supercomputers. And now we're doing data science, which is the fourth paradigm. And there's a famous book by a colleague of mine, Tony Hay, which uh, when he was at Microsoft, which describes this in a very clear fashion. More data, less theory. Here's the last slide of this set, which I just like the cheerful nature of this person here. Where is uh, this is fellow is Rajaran, and he's probably very rich, and he's um, was at Amazon and uh, and other places. I mean, like many of those early pioneers, he moved around. It was a good time to be in Silicon Valley, uh, 2008. But anyway, he pointed out that. Uh, um, more data often beats better algorithms. So he had a class, and then the students who used the more data did better than the students who really worked hard on their theory and came up with a better algorithm. And this this come, of course, there are all these competitions. And Netflix had a famous competition about the recommender engines for based on movie ratings. And um, there was a million dollar prize awarded for that for the team that um, beat Netflix's own algorithm, and that's probably an incredibly good deal for Netflix. They probably can, they probably made billions of dollars from that running. Well, now of course it's totally changed, but running recommender engines is critical to all these systems. Recommender engines, a very good example of the data-driven world, because there has no theory. It's entirely coming from the data, and this comes from an early set of lectures on data science from uh, Jeff Hammerblacher, who's at uh, Buckley and had a pretty, it's now of course presumably totally out of date, this was 2012, but um, his lectures were quite inspiring to me. This shows you when I prepared these lectures. It was 2013, and here is uh, a 2008 blog describing all of this from Rajar Raman. All right. We're in a data-driven world, and that's the end of this slide set. Thank you.